Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's live stream. Today is a very interesting day. Um, the channel hit a thousand subscribers, and um, I think maybe one third of them are people who listen. But anyways, guys, today I had a very interesting experience and I had a kind of very profound realization of a certain pattern in human behavior that I noticed in myself, but I kind of looked around and kind of noticed that others perhaps could uh, be entertaining that viewpoint as well. So the title is Recovery of the Immobilized Moral Self. And so in the subtitle, I've written Language is Morality. Now, I'm going to get into language as morality a bit later. Uh, i got to do the title justice and kind of explain to you what I mean by it. Where to begin? Today I found myself in a moment where I noticed certain ways I had accepted the world had immobilized um, various dimensions of my nature from expressing. Uh, you see, morality, dear listeners, I consider to be something that is preserved in the human mind through stories. And what do stories bring with them? They bring language. So in some sense, what you notice about every story is that it can be written, you see? So what that means is, in some sense, the language that we are introduced to and exposed to when we're young is defining, uh, in some sense, what we feel we're allowed or how the world is allowed. So how a child opens its eyes to the world will suggest the way it sees itself. I, when I was younger, I was a very kind of pacifist kind of kid, and not all the time, <laughs> but like most of the time, I wasn't up to any sort of mischief or anything, and uh, I remember when I would go there and I would just peacefully be present, people would suddenly come to me and say, like, this is when I was like 10 or 8 or something, you know, and people would say, what a good kid, you know, what a positive good kid <laughs> and so it's very fascinating because the moment when you listen to language that has been designed from another person's mind or has been generated from another person's mind it creates an interest for you to know the language your mind generates so right now the listeners are listening to my talk hopefully after you've heard enough of these mr within talks you'll understand the value of in some, sense, in some sense, sparking communication. In some sense, being able to live a life and to recognize in order to live a life and to be able to communicate in this life, the mind requires certain freedoms. These freedoms are not set. It's just kind of like there is a conditional, you have accepted the world into conditions, especially through the help of language and through the diverse uh, profoundness of mathematical language. So in some sense, we have separated the world and accepted in certain ways.
and this sort of kind of cutting the world into pieces and then accepting the ways we want that kind of is the belief game for me language trust me I've had moments where I've seen language as the greatest technology invention something that allows like our, like like let's say an external technology such as a kind of rocket ship or something like that it's gonna literally move us into another world <coughs> we literally explore let me say it like this your body is used to experience one dimension, your mind is ex used to experience multiple. The mind even exists through a multidimensionality in regards to a subtler consideration of its separation from the body. That means we couldn't talk about minds if in some sense we could not observe it or be aware of it. The fact that we are aware that we are aware we are conscious that we're conscious we're like oh my god we're alive right now like like that awareness is very supreme and it is very rare <clears throat> because this self-awareness especially for the evolutionary path of our kind of evolving ancestors they in some sense gained an awareness of self that if like that's the peak of our evolution most animals are objectively aware of themselves. Human beings are subjectively aware. And that subjectivity is malleable. It's flexible. You can have a group of people sit in a room and uh, in some sense come up with a great idea that none of them could come alone. You know, that is kind of like the efficiency of seeing all the birds fly in the sky as one. <coughs> so what is this recovery of the immobilized moral self so the immobilized moral self you know before I get into what self is but let's just say you right now if I ask you who are you and whatever is in your awareness that you feel is you let we can say that is you this uh, uh, well let, let's start from here right now as I'm speaking I find myself as a presence, as the presence of an intelligent phenomenon. That means like unlike the bricks of my house, there, there's my, my particles, atomic existence is moving with a sophistication, with a uniqueness that, for example, the inanimate cannot, does not hold that level of animation. Does not like the, um, in Italian, the word soul, a, 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 a phrase for the, um, Soul is anima, A-N-I-M-A. -A. <clears throat> In the Western world, we are not uh, strangers to the notion of animating phenomena. The whole creative industry is based on just animating things, bringing things into life, creating and uh, uh, imbuing the intelligence into the other. It's kind of like a child doesn't have too many fixed conclusions on the world. As it enters the system and the harshness and the suffering of the world, meet it and visit the child, the child eventually uh, solidifies the world. It's kind of like somebody, it's like somebody punches you and instead of you just taking in the punch, you're like, you punch me, I'm going to punch you even harder, even more intense. And so this game of solidification, as if the human response to suffering has just led to more suffering. Do you know? It's like trying to get rid of fire with fire. You know? <laughs> it's like good luck, you know? <laughs> so in order for there... To be a, an immobilized self, there should be a self that is mobile, a self that can move, a self that is free without the dictation of the environment uh, to be its mind. Or how It's as if the conditions for how your mind is set, how your mindset is, those conditions mainly probably for most people <clears throat> is based on their external conditions. That means the world is telling you how to be a moment. But I find that the moment contains within itself a purity that in some sense is rooted in a memory before the indoctrination of language. 
before the subjective reality became, uh, entered uh, a sort of activity, the objective reality had a sophistication with it. It was just like pure attention and pure matter, as if matter had no had nothing to do. <laughs> matter was just being matter. Suddenly popped out this design of a part of this universe that suddenly could be aware of itself. This is the kind of viewpoint I entertain when I think about the evolutionary position of the human being. Do you see this? That at some point, we were just unconscious movement of nature. That means there were no words, there was no knowledge, the way we acknowledge knowledge today. There was no separation of the world. It was just all one phenomena. The first separation, the most vital separation, was the separation of consciousness. What that means is that <clears throat> suddenly a part of this unconscious movement of this universal sector became aware of itself. We became the eyes of the universe that could see itself. That could we could we, we we evolved to an ability to see the universe. Then we evolved to an ability where the universe now at its edges was at the edges of our mind. And our mind is in some sense the relationship of knowledge with the unknown or the relationship of the unknown with the known. You see, it's it's two ways. In this life, either you are either your free will is moving it, moving the world, or the world is moving your free will. The modern idea of success and wealth and richness and what people want now is they want to move the world. They want to be their own boss. This is constantly being promoted. Now, this is not something that's wrong. It's not that a person should not wonder about uh, the, the, the peak evolution of the leadership mentality of their existence. But it, it, it's just one of those things where Sometimes when we have a mission to save the world, we actually stop seeing the world and we're just lost in an idea. I have been lost in so many ideas. Uh, I'm just happy I, I kind of woke up uh, to, to this kind of uh, awareness that I, I am, we are not our thoughts. When we speak, we are. Like if, I, if, I, if you were here and I was talking and you were like, How, how's, how's it going, Mr. Within? Like, how's your day? And if I gave you an answer, that answer would uh, originate from a realness in my experience. So in some sense, if I say the thought like I was happy today or I was sad today, like that concept <clears throat> has a sort of uh, symbolic accuracy to what I was or uh, in, in a certain moment. But in some sense, I'm telling you that how you should in some sense acknowledge the linguistic realm is to simply watch the changing world in front of you. There is no greater teaching, ladies and gentlemen. The world changes. <laughs> There's no one answer that could be all answers. Even that one answer, which in many religious texts there is the attempt of, is an unknown answer. As if it's God's will moving everything, yet God is unknown and it has no partner and man's mind cannot conceive that like state of being... Uh, uh, the state of the creator. So what I'm trying to say is that even when we come up with an answer, the answer is unknown. So, and the reason for this is very simple. All human beings' ideologies will lead to the unknown. It's a performance. Okay, just like how I'm saying these words and they're here now and eventually the talk will end and life will move the attention forward to wherever it else it requires to be. There's that sort of kind of resemblance. So the immobilized self, now this is a very unique thing I'm going to say in these talks, guys. Because what I'm, what I'm going to say right now is that um, <clears throat> I've experienced moments, like I experienced a moment where
pretty much I wondered if my nature was chaos and if I was conditioned to think everything must be ordered. For me, it's been a couple years since pretty much, I think, 2013 or especially definitely after 2014 and 15. But um, <coughs> for me, good and evil stopped existing. It's as if I looked at this life and I was like, okay, it's not about what is good at a certain moment of history or what is evil in a certain moment of history. Good and evil seem to be the effects of an intelligent movement which per se is not constantly valuing what is good and evil. That means people are not going around in this world constantly thinking, oh my god, am I doing something good? Am I doing something bad? Like they don't have this moral game. Now religion kind of brings you that, pro that loop of a kind of constant checking of your morality. Religion brings a sort of ethical feedback loop <clears throat> because the moment you Because the moment you accept a certain way the world is, that certain way the world is is constantly combating time. It is in some sense being challenged and being tested by time. So right now, the greatest awareness finds itself an intelligent movement. So for me, it's very unique. It's like when I see this planet, I'm like, what is death? And <clears throat> death is an end. But what is an, an end of? So it's as if when a human being recognizes the inevitable, they wonder about the origin. And this is why I'm saying, even though our mainstream in 2019 is avoiding the metaphysical, it, is, it, is, it has forgotten that the world live to greater dimensions. That means it was, it, sometimes you see that the more uh, mystic, uh, the more unknown the world is, the more uh, unique ways knowledge is moving. <clears throat> when the world is too much known, when it's known too much, when any human being who thinks they know too much, they will suddenly feel, it's very fascinating, I've seen so many people like this, even myself at some point. <laughs> Where the person's awareness to and concentration to a certain point or factor or moment in life, to some sort of data or information, it's like when the person attains some level of certainty, they want to keep the emotional value of that certainty. So based on that emotional value, they feel they know. So for me, when I was younger, I wanted to know. I wanted to be like, you know, know it all kind of person. But <laughs> I recognized through the teachings of Socrates, this ancient Greek philosopher, that it is, it is a fool's errand. That means it is very true. Man can never be God, you know? And what, what the implication of that is man cannot be everything. One particle in the universe cannot be the whole universe. That is the notion, at least how, uh, the fi how fixed our language is, acknowledges that way, acknowledges it that way. It's kind of like this, I, 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 
there's a talk I've given here. I don't know what number it is, but it was called Advanced Philosophical Investigation, something like that. And I was in Italy when I recorded, and I remember in that talk, that something happened when I was in Italy, where <clears throat> I was in the city called Gerenzano, and uh, uh, in this hotel. And I remember I was outside the hotel smoking a cigarette and just kind of like just looking at a fence. And eventually by seeing that fence, somehow my mind just leaped. The mind leaps, by the way, guys. I don't know if I've uh, ever talked about this, but I've acknowledged this, that the mind leaps. So sometimes imagination is, um, is not something that comes out of nowhere. It is like a sort of the person is on one rock in the middle of the river wondering to what rock he's going to jump into. There's a sort of landscape of true data that one needs to confront before imagination can be set, uh, set free. <clears throat> imagination is another way of saying it is the uh, attempts at manifesting the unknown natural nature's attempt at uh, first bringing an unknown and then wandering beyond it. And something that's very interesting, guys, if this world was not cyclical, uh, the species would never exist. There would never be enough of a sort of uh, balance and a static point for uh, even creatures to be on a world. Ludwig von Beethoven has this very interesting quote, guys. He says, <clears throat> He says, don't only practice your art but force your way into its secrets. For it and knowledge can raise man to the divine. What he's saying is that what every other wise man in the world has been saying, you are alive and um, don't tell yourself any story, simply live. Live and experience the various dimensions of how your mind moves. If you do the same thing every day, your mind is not moving as much as if you stretch your body when you're about to run or do some physical activity. So similarly, you have to stretch your mind. And when you stretch your mind, what happens is levels of concentration occur. And eventually, all concentration eventually can be centered. That means it's like, just like how we're on the surface of the planet, we say there is a center. We say the center has a sort of gravitational pull. So in regards to the mind's existence, first we have to be able to wonder about the subjective realm. So I realize the educational system for now on this planet is not doing this. It's doing this and it's giving it to philosophers, but philosophers don't know what to do with it. <laughs> And because it's not a philo it doesn't have philosophical utility, you know, an idea is as valuable as it can be manifest. <clears throat> or as valuable as it is expressed. That means, like, imagine somebody says, somebody is like, can order pizza. And it's like, hey guys, do you, who wants pizza here? You know? <laughs> and so we see, like, a few people respond and some people don't. And then the pizza comes, and suddenly those people haven't ordered, they suddenly find a lack of permission. 
It's very important to consider that the natural self of the being can be immobilized or you can say is, is immobilized by various programs. These programs are cultural, social, personal, impersonal. There's a vast spectrum of various systems that are all occurring together in the awareness of the being that are describing it and uh, define, that are defining it. And what that means is the environment suddenly becomes part of your thoughts. You know, a person, <clears throat> it does, it's like, I'll give you an example. There's the story that these grandkids, their grandfather's sleeping and their grandfather has a big mustache. <laughs> so as the story goes, these grandkids are like, grandpa's sleeping, let's pull a prank, you know? And so what the kids do is they go to the fridge, they find this stinky cheese or something, you know, and they put a tiny piece of it on the mustache of the grandfather, and they just act like the nicest kids ever, the most disciplined kids, and then they watch until the grandfather wakes up. The grandfather wakes up. He suddenly feels something's off. He looks at the grandkids, and the grandkids, uncommon, unlike how they always are, suddenly super nice. Like he's like, how, how are these grandkids not as cheesiest or something? <laughs> you know? And so what happens is the grandfather, he suddenly smells something. Now check this out. This is how, how powerful the environment can change, can contain a person's free will. It can direct it. <clears throat> Your attention is, is, is either being moved from within or it's being moved from without. No attention can be rema remain as not inspired by any of them because it's like in a changing world it's very hard to be neutral at least conceptually speaking so the grandfather wakes up he smells the kind of like you know gets a whiff of the <laughs> unnecessary smell and he's like oh my god it stinks here i gotta get out of this room these kids are like messed up <laughs> and so what the grandfather does is that um he goes to the kitchen he goes to the kitchen suddenly sees it stinks there he goes upstairs he sees he goes to every room of the house and this like smell that he can't figure out is coming and he's like where's the smell coming from Eventually, after going through all the rooms, the guy opens the front door and he's like, there's no way this smell's going to be outside. He goes outside and suddenly he's like, oh my God, the world stinks. <laughs> and so eventually he realizes the cheese and the grandkids laugh and the grandfather forgives as a grandfather does, you know. And so the whole notion of that was one tiny or let's say one smell like uh, like that tiny piece of cheese on that guy's mustache was defining his reality and people feel their environment doesn't define them the environment activates and authorizes your personality did you know that 
that's the power of that. It's not just the power, it's like also the cool thing, how societies have evolved <clears throat> and they've evolved in these strict dimensions because they need an authority system. So just like how you need walls for your house, society needs laws for the minds of the people to function. Laws are something fascinating, but they can also, it's like, a, it's like I remember somebody saying like, a knife can be used to cut fruit or it can be used to, you know, hurt someone. So both, both, it's like the knife doesn't have a character. It's the one who holds it. A weapon doesn't have a soul, but the hand that holds the weapon is inspired by something. And this is why we even have the word inspiration, because something is in spirit. That means it is being moved prior to material definition. That is the value of our eyes. Now we have to ask ourselves, <clears throat> what is the, how should our relationship with thought be? If you asked Aristotle, this ancient Greek philosopher, you know what he would say? He said, it's the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. That's his quote. And what he means by that is that you don't have to be defined by the data. Watch the data as it comes and goes. As Ramana Marshi says, see what remains. This is very important. Because what you see remains is the sight, is the seer, is the seer of thought, the awareness that has always been here, the attributeless kind of attention that every birthday you've blown a different candle, literally the, uh, like your, the cells of your body have changed as, as let's say from 10 years ago and you, even your thoughts have changed, but that awareness that says I'm still me, that means this is the uniqueness of how the brain is developing this pattern and you can't just say it's a billion like it's a billion year reason you know that means there's certain behaviors that we're now seeing where it's as if the human being is like an antenna that means the data that influences is not just natural okay that means it is not just like it's it's like that very profound idea where <clears throat> certain um ethnobotanists like people who study plant life and um, in some sense, these uh, this like astrophysicists, like they were, it's like it's like this discussion that where did life come from, uh, through a scientific view, and there is the possibility that there are tiny cells on one planet where the dust of that planet, like dust, kind of wind blowing it in the air, as if certain kind of unique particles or unique cells from one planet kind of travel to our planet. Okay, there is that notion. There is the notion of kind of like a, a cellular extraterrestrial contact with the soil of this world. Now, prior to any reason, we have to wonder where reason is. And so, how would I say this? It's, a, it's like, you got to have a cup to pour something in, you know? And for some people, it's as if like they need to have a thought to comprehend something. But the world is honestly a very fascinating place. When, you re when the unknown becomes your teacher, you don't become a student that judges anymore. Most people are students that judge. When I go, oh my God. Like when I walk in, guys, I'll be honest, like um, I pretty much like every other day I'm going to downtown Toronto. And um, every day I see people, as I progress through my work, I see people that I see mass collections of behavior. It's as if seeing, like, imagine there's a chessboard and all the pieces are like the same kind of piece. They're all the human species. And every human being is arising with their own chess moves. Do you know, it's as if every human being is seeing the planet. We're all on the same place in some, we're all on this rock in the middle of empty space, <clears throat> in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And how can I say it? We are a 
it's like life is a puzzle to be solved and you must only trust it no person can live by just having knowledge no person can live without knowledge it's one of those things where the known and unknown fluctuate in ratio there's certain moments where I feel like my the way the moment is, is appearing you know I don't by the way guys these talks are of, of course of uh, I, I don't consider the human being to just be defined by the human. I consider there something, there is something, and then humanity is kind of extracted, subjectively sculpted into a story of, uh, of referral. Or a story we can refer to. Your sense of self, it must be noticed that it is directed by your attention. So if you suddenly watch a, like the Godfather trilogy, at the end of it, you'll sit at a dinner table differently. I'm telling you. <laughs> Every person who truly has enjoyed watching the Godfather movies, you're going to, after watching those movies, you, your presence at a dinner table is totally different. <laughs> And so what I mean is that wherever the attention remains, very common sense, it's very common sense, it gets defined by it. It's like whatever you shine upon, shine a light upon, it suddenly, suddenly you see its designs. And wherever your attention goes, it opens up in this unknown sky, a known world. Your, your attention is, is kind of a spear of knowledge thrown at an unknown sky based on whatever you, wherever your attention goes. For now, we have to, I find this to be the coolest moment in history, 2019, even though many people are going to be like, are you serious, bro? You think it's the coolest one? <laughs> and I'm, I'll, I'll tell you, the reason it's incredible to be alive in 2019 is because the puzzle hasn't been solved yet. That's the thing. That means the future generations are in danger of not having enough challenges if we suddenly solve this. So for me, life is not about just solutions. It is about the right problems. So you see, there never is an answer. It's just that the experience or the awareness of the problem shifts and in shifting, new vision in some sense is accessed. Even Albert Einstein says this. Albert Einstein says um, you cannot solve a problem from the same level of consciousness that created it. So what that means is you cannot find anything new if your attention doesn't change, you see? <clears throat> and this is very important because I find that Carl Jung's contribution and just the evolution of these words such as the conscious mind, the subconscious, the unconscious, the collective unconscious, the personal unconscious, all of these are very crucial because the social creature is not just an objective form, but we're only acknowledging it as that. So for me, it's like there's 8 billion, not just, it's not we're just ob overpopulated, you know, uh, humans on this planet. It's not, that's not the case. Overpopulation is not an issue if we can build the right planes. It's just that there's 8 billion points of access to new visions of the world. We are the backup system to nature. We are, we are Gaia's personality. We are how the planet has become a person and how the planet is interconnected with all that existence is. Because one thing they don't tell you is existence is here. Do you see why, why eventually life will be driven to a, to a very deep dimension? It's because <clears throat> the depth of, has always been in there. It's just the person who hasn't swam underneath the surface of the ocean. So we must in some sense explore the beyond the surface of our mind, but in what manner are we doing it? Do we just go in it with a scheduled kind of like mission? 
like like we're a SWAT team trying to discover the unconscious mind, you know, trying to pe- you know penetrate the unconscious mind, kind of break the door in and just go for calculate everything and figure it out. I find that there's two ways that knowledge arises. Okay, it either arises from a change of self or a change of world. It's very simple. It's like just like how simply the scientists can look at a tree and say that's a bunch of atoms, bro. <laughs> And so it's very true. You can say it's a bunch of atoms, but you can at the same time see see the whole thing as a tree. And so it's so incredible how language has interweaved with objective matter through an oscillation of human consciousness between its individual known existence and its collective unknown, in some sense in quotations, non-existence. That means you're you're because you blink because the sensory data is like every like I don't know like microsecond kind of turning on and off. It's as if we are a generator. You know, like do you know those generators that kind of like those old <laughs> you know static electric kind of like generator. I don't know how to say it. Like, but the. <laughs> So you have to clean your glasses before you can see the pure reality. From a religious angle, how you, there you don't guys, this is something incredible that many secular societies don't acknowledge about religion, that in religion there is a purification. Uh, how can I, I shouldn't say purification, I should say it like, there is, there is a sort of incredible emphasis on purity, okay? And so we find that the best, the person, like the person who's trying to be religiously the best person is a person who's trying to be pure all the time. But that is a fallacy. Because your purity is based on what you identify as impure. And the moment you identify impurity, your mind's already there. There's, the mind runs, it's like a scout. Your intellect is a scout. It runs quicker. It projects various ways the moment can occur. And so you don't just have access to the objective data. You have access to the subjective variations of the objective data. You have access to these parallel ways of uh, modes of perception of reality and even when you incorporate a sort of wisdom of realizing change is occurring it, there's no longer a teaching all these people trying to find some secret truth in India about enlightenment like uh, give me a break <laughs> the world is not like that the world breaks every belief it's not like it doesn't matter if somebody comes and says I don't believe that it's like the world breaks us because it breaks us the beliefs shall break what remains is the value of the vision. So think of it this way. Every human being is like a light trying to explore this dark forest of the cosmos. You know, and every person is like their own. <clears throat> it's like, I find the value of life, it's, it's too soon. Our species is too young to being constantly repeat something. It's like, you don't tell a young kid, this is why we're, child labor is illegal. Because the child is, is, so, is, is unjaded by social norm, it, is, it, does, it doesn't want to fit in yet, the child. It doesn't even have the concept in its mind to fit into some social, sort of social process. It is conditioned into it. It's as if we don't realize. It's like we, people don't go through a military training, but subjectively you kind of have. And that's the when you suddenly discover the various programs, the various ways that wor- the le- words and how they're sequenced is holding your reality. This is why writing is so crucial. Writing, it's like the next levels of how your intelligence opens up to you has to do with you writing or you expressing your creativity. Let me tell you why. Because it becomes a mirror. Think of yourself as your. Think of your moment of being as an uh, as a uh, kind of universal performance, and you are both having an access of the audience member, and at the same time having access as um, as an actor. 
you're the audience of your own act and you're an actor of all you have seen. The mind has to do something, just like our, how our ancestors had to like eat, they had to like find food, food, they had to like somehow survive. The mind is trying to survive, but the mind doesn't eat, it doesn't have a mouth. What the mind does is it tries to contain. This is why in the Rig Vedas there's this very profound saying, where they say the mind is a slave to the real. Like that was one of those sentences where it made me grateful to be alive to hear it. And the Rig Vedas are an ancient Vedic text from, I don't know, like thousands of years ago. I think to be accurate, it could be ranging from 3,000 years ago or to 10,000 years. I don't know. They're mystical texts, so there's a lot of unknown factors there in regards to the accuracy of the historical point of the ideology. Sometimes we never know when ideas occurred, when philosophers actually spoke. It was just how far the ideas were passed. How long did the ideas live? How well did the, were the ideas relayed? How honest were the scribes of humanity in establishing the current history? There's a lot, a lot of it included. So we find ourselves in a strange moment where we realize we're imagining reality. And uh, I'll create a word right now for this. Uh, uh, reality, reality fine. <laughs> or another word is, and realizing imagination. For me, it's as if, like, trust me, these, I, I don't understand how certain yogis I see I see certain videos it's like it's very good that you promote love love is so important but when a village is under attack I mean how you can't expect love to be your bodyguard when 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 there are forces of nature shifting the position the mind has to make a choice do I want to be moved by the world or should I live for what has value and every person's mind generates its own values. And the more honest you are and you have this kind of detached awareness of the cultural program, you stop getting defined by it. And so stress and depression cease to exist. There was this person named uh, Shiri Prabhupada. And he was kind of the originator of the Hare Krishna movement, I, I believe in the 80s. Like when there was kind of like this whole LSD hippie movement going on. <laughs> It's like this dude just came from India to America and started this Hare Krishna movement. And in this Hare Krishna movement, I mean, there is a kind of, of course, yogic metaphysics connected to all, the whole thing. But in some sense, the notion is to be pure and to have attention constantly on That's it. What else do you think a religious person can do? All these religious institutions, all these buildings and organizations and institutions, what do you think they're doing? They are trying to uh, find truth and then be it. They are trying to copy truth and then paste it. They're, they are, that, they're, trust me, it's like I don't, I don't dis, disregard religion because it was, it, was, it was something that was crucial to history's development. As if every sec secular person, every atheist must in some sense be grateful for God's ideology that can make them define themselves as such. And I don't, I don't mean they should be grateful. I, what I'm saying is that it's as if you need the idea of something there to then reject it or be able to de reject the concept. <clears throat> so it's one of those things. It's like when, when, when uh, we see a character kind of like in a story fighting an enemy and they're both great warriors, it's as if like your enemy is in some sense how can I tell you you respect your enemy because it is a challenge that evokes in you the intensity that is required to handle it so for me trust me there's been moments where you have to the mind has to navigate as the shamans did it or the Native American culture kind of embraced this and many cultures the shamanic approach is that it's a sort of ceremonial transition of mind. 
And so again, we find in religions, what is its ceremonies? Oh my God, it's like loop, loop, loop land. Trust me. <laughs> and it's not just the issue with religion, guys, because the thing is, it's not religion that's the issue. It's language. Religion is just a part of language. It's as if all the words that are being in a religious book could totally be different words. When we look at the translation of, for example, the Bible of, or any holy text, it's as if it's, it's not the same symbols. You know, the lettering, the alphabets are different. Do you see? Yet, the ideas are there. But here's the unique thing. The alphabets are based on culture. They're based on how w those words came into motion, based on people using it, people who were living in that society. So my understanding is that even though a book can be translated, for example, I read for Lao Tzu, this Chinese philosopher's quote. When I read that quote, I don't get, like, I'm not saying that's 100% what Lao Tzu said, you see. But I see the value. And it's one of those things where it's as if, um, how can I say it? It's like, there, it, there are barriers. There are certain things that immobilize the author, authorization the individual gives themselves to be more than what they think they are. There's many ways that things aren't allowed. And society, especially with how inefficiently our civilization, uh, how the social program is, it's like, honestly, we need to all, there needs to occur a global community and people need to sit on that table and it needs to be like a live stream where, for the whole world and people are like, okay, what do we do? How do we redesign uh, the, the structure to civilization's evolution? How do we uh, allow efficiency its opportunity to, to be here? What that, what that means is it's like you're alive, you're a temporary being. Uh, why not wonder about the nature of eternity? Why not wonder about infinity? Why not wonder about all those views that you only get one lifetime to wonder about? How, um, oh God, um, let me see how I can share it. Your sense of self is layered through language to various events and incidents divided by time. So pretty much we have acknowledged there is a space here. And in this space, there is form.
this form wonders about all the ways it can exist in this space. Your true self is a moment of attributeless attention and it is a witnessing of the objective realm and the subjective realm. So when you have in some sense brought your thoughts into stillness and also brought your body into stillness, then you watch. And then instead of something moving in front of your eyes to be evidence for truth, your eyes move and that's the evidence. Uh, just a second, guys. I got to get a charger for this laptop. How far can the mind see itself? What are the value of ideas in a changing world? How does true intelligence remember itself? What is freedom? Is freedom the conditions of the world? Is freedom the conditions of the self? Are we imperfection going towards perfection? Are we perfection going towards imperfection? Are we perfection going towards perfection? Or are we imperfection going towards imperfection? Where is the value? And so it's very incredible. Because the child that looked at the world and saw the infinite garden of beliefs 
It is now time to break the idols of man's worship, but these idols are the idols of thought. It is how there was a time, in this, like this is the pretty much a very principal point of the Abrahamic religions, where pretty much uh, Abraham, or in, in the Islamic tradition they say Ibrahim. And so Abraham, there were a bunch of pantheists or people who were worshipping uh, objects like wood and stuff from nature. They were worshipping like their own idols, statues they would make. And so he, this man comes and sees, and this is the story in, in the Islamic tradition of the Kaaba. So that cube, uh, that cube where uh, all Muslims in the world, their attention gravitates to, Mecca. That place is a holy place because it was kind of the birth of, it was, it was not the birth, it was the breaking of ignorance. That's why that place is very important. It was where it was considered inside the Kaaba was where the statues of various, these people who worshipped statues in some sense, all their statues were there. One day they come and see a Abraham and they see Abraham is standing beside only one of the statues and there is a sh like a stick or like some sort of stick right beside the statue and Abraham's just uh, like his back is on the wall and uh, all the other statues are broken. And so suddenly this guy, come, the people come and they're like, Abraham, did you do this? Abraham, did you do this? And Abraham's like, no, this one statue did it. Okay. There's a sort of narrative like this in a, in, in, in a religious context. And what happens is um, that people suddenly snap out of this worship of objects. So object worship was kind of that ignorance was broken. Now check this out. What happened after we stopped worshipping idols? This is the question. This is the most important question. What happened when the person stopped worshipping idols? We stopped uh, thinking that, oh my God, truth is an object. You know? <laughs> what happened is... We thought it's a subject. We started worshipping ideas. We started worshipping names. We started making symbols the rulers of our attention. And that's how the world began to be measured. And so, in this era, I say again, of ideal worship, people, they don't, they don't believe in God, but they're worshipping their ideas. Like, like, like when I say worshipping their ideas, they feel that's the way they see life is the only way. Trust me, we are a speck of dust in a light beam called this cosmos. Our humility is our, is our first step. Then beyond our humility is, is a sort of uh, kind of more, new moral finding of the civilization. So that means after human beings stop their violent activity, there will be certain years of a strange peace. It's as if humanity will feel this sort of phase where people are no longer being violent, but they're not being too much either. So if you notice the way the kind of, I find global community is being driven, uh, all the societies are kind of being influenced by this, is that as technology kind of, uh, has built this network of where data can transition from various parts of the world, people have moved towards their entertainment. It's as if there was a time where we moved towards shelter. Like we as creatures on this planet, we're like, okay, we got to get out of these natural forces of the world that are kind of like, uh, you know, pushing us. And so what happened is we now go towards entertainment. And when we go towards entertainment, what that means is, we are being draw driven by what has always been exciting. And so if a person follows their authentic excitement, oh my God, let me tell you, you have found a moment of behavior that can, your, all your ancestors uh, had a choice to make. And that was whether to step into the unknown and trust how life would work out or stay in a, in a sort of comfort zone bunker of knowledge till the day where eventually they were forced out. You see, beliefs are kind of like a house where people are like some sort of bunker 
not like even a house, a bunker where it's sheltering the person from the unknown. But the per it's also like a t-shirt where if eventually, like uh, when you're a kid, you have a t-shirt, like you'll grow out of it. You can't wear that t-shirt anymore. So similarly, as life constantly changes, the belief structure or construct is endlessly challenged till the day it dies. And that's a very unique thought because we, we don't animate thoughts. We say, well, they're just thoughts. I'm just having thoughts right now, right? We don't give it a personality. You see, it's as if we are the person and the thoughts we are thinking. Do you see? We acknowledge it like that. However, the world is projected I honestly don't know how to finish that sentence. <laughs> it, it's projected by nature, yet the free will remains. So your free will is going to either be real. So you're going to, you're pretty much, I think all human beings are divided like this. You're either thinking you, you are a part of this world or you think you're not. If you think you are not a part of this world, you will reject yourself subjectively from many opportunities that life brings. It's strange. It's a sort of immobilization. It's as if you can be better, yet you're not. And so why is the ability you see in your mind's eye not accessible in front of your eyes? The ability you see within yourself, behind your eyes, why is it not there? How come that when I think of the future, the world, regardless of what I imagine, never turns out to be like that? What is this incredible ability of change? And so that's the thing. This is why our educational system, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, is all it can be <clears throat> is an illusion that shelters us until we realize the truth. Through incredible stillness and silence comes an incredible awareness of motion and noise. And so this is very important what I say for anybody who they experience altered states of consciousness, especially in like in like, how can I say it on Fridays, people really alter their state of consciousness. <laughs> And of course, the world has this constant kind of, it's this new cultural, not new, but it's, it's kind of been there for a while, but it's how there is a sort of chemical, uh, uh, we are chemical beings. So when, the, when our chemistry changes, regardless of whether we like it or not, reality is changed. We are never in one in the same chemical state. That means like as when I'm saying when I in this whole talk, I've been speaking uh, the brain, the, the, the neural pathways, it's like they're not on like some loop. It's like various parts of the brain are lighting up in their own way. So what that means, it's like that moment where the ordered reality has to want, has to in some sense confront the chaotic imagination. This chaotic imagination is the source of the fear of your reality, okay? And fear is not something like, the, I, I, feel, I feel it will be arrogant if you say, I have no fear. <laughs> it's like, damn, man, you're, you're like, so what? You're so brave. You know, life changes. You know, if you don't experience fear, you have denied yourself nature. But at the same time, just to remain in fear is also denying yourself nature. When life becomes when life becomes a journey of
constantly learning from how the unknown moves you that you know. You're going to realize the teacher is the unknown. That the greatest teachers are all bowing to the unknown. There is no knowledge to be certain of. There is no winning lottery ticket of language that's going to contain all truth. Life is too, 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 too multidimensional to, to even be defined by one dimension. How dare a dimension define all dimensions? How dare one view contain all? What is that? That's, that's like a language... That's when language becomes an abomination, when the cultural program doesn't evolve. You know, um, there was this scholar named Terence McKenna, this ethnobotanist named uh, Terence McKenna. He said, he's somebody who studies plants, and he's, he said something very fascinating. He said, a, like he had come to conclusions on certain cultural truths, and he said a culture evolves as fast as its language does. And what he said there isn't as, is not like new, but the way he said it was incredibly new. Terence McKenna, because prior to him, there was Ludwig Wittgenstein, this German philosopher who was badass. And he had this quote where he said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. So we see that the, rea the edge of reality. So if the, if the Rig Veda said the mind is a slave to the real, we see the edge of reality to be in language. So the mind is actually a slave to a language or a slave to how it contains itself. So this is why humility is important because humility doesn't mean religious goodness. I mean, I'm not devaluing religion. I'm just saying we should not be in one room when life has so many. We should not just sit in one place when there's so many ways that the world can maintain itself. Our eyes must open in a way where we realize they were never closed. That's when the he suddenly, we, it's like I, I, sometimes I imagine I've written like endless poem, like poems for, on this. But it's, it's that moment when nature, it, it, like human beings will feel not only has nature forgiven them, but now it is inspiring them. As if man is no longer fighting his world, he is calming it down. We are calm. Imagine a moment where the species is so calm that wild animals, you know, and of course we'll have technological protection, right? <laughs> but wild animals, like in, in the future, are just walking gently across the street because we have realized the value of the mind. Beyond technocratic thinking. <laughs> What is power when we all die? What is power? Is it just controlling the, the play, the, the theatrical play of this house, how values of life emerge? Is it controlling people's minds? What is, what is power? And I will tell you what is power. It is only freedom. And if you can free your world, you will free yourself. If you can free yourself, you will free your world. And hence, in the Buddhist tradition, we have the, the walk of the Buddha and the walk of the Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva, the Buddha is a person who's going from the bottom of the mountain to the top. What that means is individual consciousness is recognizing its inevitable uh, uh, reemergence uh, re as kind of like the collective. So pretty much the, the individual is getting enlightened. The, like the individual consciousness is remembering itself as the collective, but bodhisattva, this 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 word, it's like when the collective consciousness re remembers the individual. So in one manner we have an individual being going towards a collective outcome. In another manner we have already a established collective being reemerging as an individual being. This is why the, well, what the, uh, uh, why Dalai Lama is called the fourteenth Dalai Lama for example, why there was a person named Guru Padmasam Baba, why there, why there are these certain very traditional figures, the, because in their story of who they were, they preserved an archetype, which was a profound metaphor. That means sometimes you cannot, you cannot live other people's lives, yet you can enjoy, watch it from a distance and be inspired. That happens to me every time I 
think of something and then suddenly discover somebody in history I thought of. It's fascinating for me. It's as if me and that person in history are standing in the same terrace, seeing the same view. That's the language is very multidimensional, yet it, it, it functions like pr primarily your exist existential value is a kind of maintenance of your objective self. So that means oh, these talks that I'm giving, it's like I'm not advising anybody to go meditate for years or something. I've never said that. You know, it's like I'm not to meditation, I, like the best you can do is just 20 minutes a day. You just build up to 20 minutes and start from 10, 10 minimum, where for 10 minutes, you can just sit somewhere. You don't have to meditate, no belief or whatever. You're just, you can go like on your, there. Just be in your, be with your world and, in, and just observe how you're in this world. There is a sort of relief, a sort of bliss that arises in the intelligence of the person when they don't have to constantly behave in a certain way. This constant behave in a certain way, it's only... It's like there's only suffering if you suffer. This is why the strong, they don't, it's suffering at most can be just a little, uh, you know, wiping dust, dust off their shoulder after a confrontation. The reason is, is because if the person acknowledges the narrative of weakness, the narrative, their attention is no longer on the narrative of the strong. Your health really depends on how your attention moves in this life. Your health, not just your health, your intelligence depends on how your attention moves in this life. And you can just in one moment just wonder, okay, so my attention for how many years, for however many years I've been alive has been sculpted. Your beliefs, your interests, your views, these are various ways uh, your, your eyes moved in the world. What is a memory? It is the dance of the eyes in space and time. So once the mind is acknowledged as a technology, it suddenly becomes like a vehicle. Like you don't use your car all the time, but you use it to get to a certain destination. You use the mind becomes something like it becomes a sheathed sword. Okay. So that means you, you walk throughout the day through not having too many thoughts. But when a situation arises from the stillness, the, the pride, like when you, oh, how do I say this? When the ripples of your pondering mind settle, uh, in, in gentleness, you suddenly find the most accurate observations of chaos. That means seldom this is said, but at the end of the tunnel of order is chaos. And it's the opposite as well. At the end of the tunnel of chaos is order. That means the hell of the good is bad. The hell of the bad is good. Isn't that hilarious? Trust me, a lot of our beliefs have been sabotaged by the design of the linguistic program. That means if somebody was to explain something, it could never resemble the true accurate experience. There's some experiences on this planet where we don't have words for. How, can, how do I know this? It's very simple because then we put words on stuff. You see? We make objects into suddenly iced cappuccinos. <laughs>
Clarity is an ever-present truth. If truth, in some sense, changed, it could never be shaped. It's like if somebody asks you, what is the shape of speed? What is the form of time? You see, it's, it's as if these are abstract acknowledgments of how certain pattern is existing. A certain movement is here. So trust me, when you want to truly know life, you will go to a point where you realize you don't know. Socrates says the only true wisdom is to know that you know nothing. Why does some guy who knew incredibly a lot for his time in some sense, say the only true wisdom is to know that you know nothing. It means to not shape the world and then walk like a fool in it. It means to care. There's, it's like you are alive, other people are alive, our species is, is the most intelligent species on this planet, yet if it is caught in, 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 in uh, non-intelligent behavior, it is a waste. It is a waste of our evolutionary development as a species if we fail to see something better and not attempt it. So this would be, this is something where uh, in, in my earlier talks, way earlier, like I think maybe like 400 talks before I, uh, this one I'm saying now. It's like I remember talking about This concept I developed, and later on I realized alchemy kind of had got into that idea first, but they had opened people up to it in a weird way. <laughs> but the concept is the great work. And I, I suddenly conceived, oh my God, what are people doing, these individual jobs for these in institutions? We should empower the individual so their imagination opens up. How do we empower the individual? By valuing them. That, that means the issue of civilization is the way people are valued. This is the whole conflict. This is the damn game of civilization. Where we are, fought, where we are trying to bring civility through language, yet not realizing the tolerance we require to actually develop the proper multidimensional efficient system. That means it's like we're all at the designer's table, yet people are fighting over which pen to hold. We have to design civilization. It, 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 it can, it, the only way it's designed is from the inner reality to influence the outer. That means you have forgotten about something that is actually the, the most, this is where your ability comes from. It comes from you observing phenomena. And when you observe it, you can do it with uh, assumption and bias, or you could do it without assumption and bias, and then you get access to the pure data. And then the pure data, based on however way your eyes are open, can reanimate the structure of the uh, existential pattern. This is why every day feels like it, there's a different karma at work. I was thinking, like, is, they say you the wheel of karma. The Buddha spoke about the wheel of karma. And I'm like, what is this? Is this like a hamster wheel? kind of a karmic structure where it's just the same program running over and over and over again. What occurs when the hamster gets tired? And so it has to be evolution. The concept of evolution is actually as unknown as God because it is change. And what inspires change is so multifaceted, multi, uh, so many various things are influencing it that it's kind of like I mean, I don't disagree with the butterfly effect, but when I look at the cause of a butterfly, I see various forces at work.
when the moral structure is based on language and when language is based on attention and when attention is based on the free will and when the free will is just how the being's knowledge is preserved in the unknown and when the attention returns to the unknown and when knowledge recalibrates there is no outcome that's important in some sense it is the recognition of a deeper process within the current process and that is the only sort of realization can occur because even the idea of self-realization the whole point of enlightenment was that what are you realizing you're realizing the self of selves you're realizing the cause <clears throat> It's kind of realizing the infinite possibility that your cause and effect dynamic is an effect of another cause. And in, it's this endless view that there's a cause to the cause to the cause. And this is the sort of philosophical notion of an infinite regression, which to our social uh, linguistic-based structures of contemplating society and reality, it is, it is savage fallacy. It's like nothing can infinitely loop. <laughs> That means um, there's uh, we I, I've, I no human being I feel has perceived infinity. They have seen an infinite illusion. They have seen a hollow infinity. This is a term I've created, where and the reason I created this term is because I had an experience when I was really young, where in my house in Iran when I was like seven, something like around that age, I remember there was two windows. Uh, sorry, not two windows. <laughs> There was, um, I had a closet where the doors were mirrors. And so the doors opened from inside and it was kind of like a big closet, like a walk-in closet, like one of those. And so when the doors opened inside, these two mirrors were facing one another so I could see the infinite kind of optical illusion of my reflection. And so as I'm seeing all these parallel kind of leading to some sort of optical vanishing point, of my own reflections, I realize the infinity that never was there. Or in some sense, another way of saying the truth that cannot be shaped. So the excitement returns to the direct experience. You tap into the instincts and intuition of your experience driving you rather than, or you being driven by your direct experience rather than you being driven by your ide ideological kind of uh, cherry-picked kind of path. You, you, you re respect and honor nature. You come into peace with nature. That means you are right now in pieces with nature. You are considering yourself your own total thing and you're considering all the world as a separate thing. When suddenly there is this kind of reunion, this is the point of yoga, by the way, Yoga, the word means union. The union of what? The union of the individual activity with the cosmic activity. Right now they're being considered separate and language is the veil of thought. And so the study of attention becomes fascinating because we suddenly realize it's as if uh, language is the glove and the real hand is not just something that occurs through words. So do you know how much, you know how much our minds right now as a civilization have been conditioned to language? So what I'm saying perhaps could be chaotic to some people, but don't, as Aristotle says again, entertain an idea without accepting it. That means watch. You have always been doing this. Now it, it, it incorporates in your conscious because it always is a sort of chaotic transformation. The caterpillar's cells and the cocoon die. All the cells, once the caterpillar cells have died, once that reality simulation, organic reality simulation closes, suddenly a new reality simulation occurs. Suddenly the butterfly opens its wings, transcending the cocoon or the conceptual uh, limitation. So the immobilized self attained, uh, receives its morality. So you suddenly stop trying to fit into a sort of thought structure. You become a simple moment of being. It's a moment where there is no judge. There is no judgment.
It is as the mystical poet by the name of Jamaluddin Maulana Rumi from like, I believe, 700 or 900 years ago, like around that time. This man has this quote where he says, silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. So the contentment with silence is the resolution to chaos. The contentment uh, with uh, stillness is the resolution to chaos. Yet, you're not just, just remaining in those states. You're just being able to acknowledge it. You have faith in the world you walk in. And a world that you're part of. Karma only exists because fear exists, and because fear exists, the free will don't, doesn't feel it's free, so it's endlessly changed. It's like, it's like karma is hilarious, guys. It's a blindfold. And so people are like, oh, man, let me get out of this karmic structure. We, we hear stories of yogis. For example, Sri Ramana Maharshi, who is a man I was very... Uh, he, he was a very, he was a sort of beacon of grace in regards to how the mind moves, in my view. Sri Ramana Marshi, he's known to say meditation is your true nature. And he says, he had a student, he had disciples, he lived in uh, this uh, world, uh, temple. Sri Ramana Maharshi, he, this man, in some sense, and, uh, entertained the cultural framework of being a guru and having disciples. His disciples asked him, what's the all ultimate truth? And he told them, silence. And when he said silence, in some sense, his disciples, suddenly their attention reset. They, f they found they instantly calmed down. You don't understand how much your mind is, <clears throat> your creativity is amplified in gentleness, in playfulness and gracefulness. Playfulness has to do with how much you fear fear. <laughs> if you don't fear fear, you know, there's nothing to fear. <laughs> like that's the, you know, you, uh, some people say humor was a gift from the gods, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> honestly, I like the, I have no reference. I that's the thought that came to me now. But I'm pretty sure there was a, there were. I know that there were societies that entertained a sort of theatrical approach to life, and the theater reality has moments where the known cannot, where the known doesn't understand how the unknown's moving, and humor just ex originates. Or something unknown happens, surprising happens, and the known suddenly, in some sense, uh, re uh, realigns. Your attention is your altar. Think of it this way. You should not, I personally will say, listen, what is, many people worship the holy book. And I am in I'm non, no, no way saying that religious people do not have freedom of thought. You can, you can do whatever you like in this world. You can do whatever. That's the point. But it, when I say whatever you like, it doesn't mean imposition. That means, you see, you, you can enforce objective limitations, but you cannot limit someone's mind. You know? This is why in movies we see that kid, child who he lost something and his whole life becomes dedicated to vengeance or revenge. And that's a waste of a lifetime. Revenge is a waste of time. 
Reg regret is a waste of time. Life is too, there's so much more waves of data hitting you that the past cannot contain. Some person trying to predict the future with the past, you know, it's kind of like somebody taking a cup, taking a small glass, you know, like a coffee glass underneath a waterfall. And it's like, I'm going to fill, I'm going to hold the whole waterfall with this cup. It's like impossible, buddy. <laughs> so, so what I mean by that is it's as if the, the, it's too unknown, yet it is too fascinating. So it becomes an explorative attitude. So exploration, and when I say exploration, this doesn't mean just, there's many, it's like there's many ways a person can walk, but we have to find a way for 8 billion people to walk efficiently enough for waves of innovation and genius occur. That means like if I have a plan for world peace, like Mr. Within's plan for world peace, I feel the first attempt at it should be a phase. We can't have world peace forever. Like, what? what is this? It's like, it's like impossible. The weather changes all the time. But peace can be a space as if we, just like how we built again shelter and we moved there to protect ourselves from the forces of nature, we are now building a shelter of an efficient civilization, a civilization that is no longer at war with the other. A civilization where trust is the permission for the greatest innovative movement. You cannot, you cannot, you, everybody knows this, like you cannot have a relationship with anyone if you don't trust, if you don't trust the person. And in some sense, when I say trust doesn't mean trust everything, but I mean like you have to trust your moment of existence for existing to be able to engage it. So the mind eventually, they, they say, this is like an ancient saying, where they say, kind of like sages would say this, where the mind is a lousy master, but a great servant. And how the mind serves you is how your attention is being here. And there is nothing more magnificent. What else can be more magnificent than how attention is being the moment? and how the moment is not being just your body, but it is also being your mind. So your mind is your moment. Like this could be good rap lyrics. Your mind is your moment, your moment is your mind. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> but um, what I'm trying to say is there is that, that view. We cannot ignore. We cannot ignore the user of language. It appears to be a consciousness that prior to conceiving itself was the awareness of how the world moved. If, if right now, if you spoke to a scientist, the scientist would say, look at your atoms. These atoms are the same atoms that were stars. We are stardust in some sense. Carl Sagan would entertain this notion. And if we are stardust, and if energy is not created or destroyed, that means we're all considering that existence is. And because we're considering existence is, there comes the ability to consider the infinitude of various ways infinite existence can be, and then the stories of life and the simulations of the animal mind ar arise. So when you treat yourself as a moment of being, there is a sort of attributelessness to this. This attributelessness is not an it's not you trying to det be detached or like pure or morally just like an angel all the time. Like no such thing can happen. This is why people can't see angels. And the reason is because if an angel was on earth, it would not be an angel. It would be limited to chaos and order. An angel doesn't experience chaos. I remember reading this line of poetry. I can't, there's no way I can remember like who, who said it, but I remember the line. And it was something like angels, the, the incredible thing about angels or the concept of the angel is that 
it has to listen to the divine will of the creator. So an angel, its will is not even considered to have to be free. It is just like the light beam of the sun. There is no free will. It is an expression. So an angelic state is the notion of the personality's movement towards the unknown, impersonal, divine. Your moment is fascinating. when the blindfolds are taken off? And what if language is a blindfold for an ever-present universal intelligence? Is the species ready to wonder about the depths of the intelligence? of the mind that finds itself in the body, as if your mind has no choice in be, being kind of connected to your physical body. That's the fascinating thing. Mind and body are kind of like, again, like the, in a yin-yang dynamic, kind of in a night and day without one another. They don't exist. The spectrum doesn't exist. The subjective component doesn't exist. Language is a generator. Uh, language is, is, is generated in the furnaces of duality. And so, guys, because this is, um, this episode is special, there is a, uh, there were 1,000 subscribers. I'm going to continue longer than I normally do. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can kind of share insight on this notion. Because for me, when I speak, I also hear what I'm saying. <laughs> and because I'm hearing what I'm saying, saying, in some sense, there's this constant uh, awareness to what has been made aware of. And once you come into a sort of contentment with your attention, once you befriend the spirit of your of your life, I mean that's a strange sentence, but I'll say it like this: once you, once you realize your real eyes, you might not believe this, but the evolution of art. is when the clouds of non-existence move away and a new sky is found. Find the new sky of your reality. There's no greater task. You know, we, evolution, nature has opened your eyes. Now it's time for the human being to open its mind. That is, that is the gift that only you can give yourself because nobody in this world has your eyes. Do you see the value of your sight? Do you see the value of your vision? Do you see the creativity that you carry? It's, in, it's just, in, it, it just in the essence of your DNA. Your DNA is, a, is, is your unique design. If all your ancestors were alive and watching you, they'd be like, wow, look at, the, you know, look at how the next generation walked. Even in Japanese culture, and not just in Japanese, like Cherokee culture, Native American cultures, just every culture, there was an honor, honor of the ancestor because there was an honor of the father and the mother. And there was an honor of how life came to be life. And this honor was not forgotten. This is why children must be, uh, in some sense, uh, incredibly like in the presence of your parents, be, be like a uh, samurai, kind of like honoring the lineage. <laughs> <clears throat> because life is, 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 is a kind of, it becomes beautiful when you accept it. If you don't accept it, you cannot even see beauty in it. 
And when it becomes beautiful, that's when the unknown is its, is, 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 is its own revelation. Suddenly, the, the, the self's sense of morality or the sense of self that are, brings forth its, that unique design of morality of the moment, it no longer is immobilized because its morality is no longer based on language it has to keep as the world. So that immo immobility doesn't mean run into anarchy, run into chaos. Like, yeah, you know, no, no more beliefs. That is going to run, run around like a madman. Like, I'm telling you, this life is not about extremes. It is an extreme condition. We're on a rock in the middle of nowhere in a unique kind of axis of the planet, in a unique uh, position in regards to where the sun is. We're not so far that it's too cold for life, and we're not so close that there is... And we're burning in life, in light, you know? It's, it's where we're, it's like the planet is very well designed. And so it's pretty much eventually all human beings, it, it doesn't matter. I feel any, every human being wonders about this eventually in some way in their life. <clears throat> they wonder about if this is a simulation, is it arising from what I'm calling me? Or is it arising from the world where this sense of me has arisen from? And where are the distinctions? In some sense, how is Tony Stark getting into the Iron Man suit? <laughs> so then the recovery has already occurred because the attention has freed itself from the chains of the linguistic simulation. And you suddenly attain your own, <laughs> I call like playful decency. You stop, you stop having strict views. That's greed. That's when greed arises. Because the person thinks, oh man, things have to be exactly in this way or life wouldn't happen the way I want it. Like, what is that? It is, it is a sort of narcissistic approach to the success. This narcissism, it has efficiency, but it only leads towards technological efficiency because the morality is being sacrificed for the reward of uh, kind of the economical system. So in some sense, imagine like we suddenly stopped having wars, but then it doesn't mean there isn't other forces combating us. And so the civilization is functioning through programs. And so economy is a program. How, how we right now, currency is a part of our lives. We require money to be alive in, in a society. So we see what that means is we have to acknowledge a common value. And a lot of people see money as an evil thing, which is strange to me because money is what you have in common with every other human being. One of those things, one of those social activities where just by acknowledging the process, it is opening up dimensions of com uh, communication. So for me, if there was no, no such, like some people, said, they're like, for me, I don't believe life should be equal because it can't, it changes. The format is changing all the time. It's like right before you make your chess move, suddenly the chess board changes. Right before you make you move another piece, the chess, world cha chess board changes constantly. So what that means is <sighs> we have to ride change. We can't just try not to change. This is why any person, I sometimes see these, I mean, I have incredible respect for uh, the entertainment sector of the civilization and also incredible like ignorance is alive ignorance tends to also be uh, ignorance and clarity tend to be in the same neighborhood <clears throat> as if they ask this kind of poet and they're like how did you learn to be so polite sir and he was like, I learned it from the root. He saw chaos and designed his own order. He saw order and designed his own chaos. And hence, we have Batman and, his, and the Batman villain. <laughs> we have these archetypes of the heroic structure where one sense of force of order, order surpasses a force of chaos yet if if the tables were turned for example in in the avengers if we looked at things from the eyes of thanos we'd be like oh my god the avengers are, are the enemies 
if we looked at the eyes of, for example, the Avengers, would be like Thanos is the enemy. So it's it, it, uh, it, the heroic structure mainly depends on which side you're looking from, and it's the same thing. Like we see this incredible Russian writer, and <clears throat> enlightened mind by the name of Neil Tolstoy talk about this, and he talks about how uh, many nations go. Let's like for example, Russia and Japan, they blindly went at war with one another. And soldiers who didn't even know who they were fighting killed one another. Do you see? And it was a sort of massacre of of the pro uh, potential of the species when war occurred. It was the occupation of people's mind towards an inefficient combat. Do you see? And sometimes, of course, we need to have a, like what I'm talking about, guys. Don't think it's the world today. It is the world perhaps to come. Or it is perhaps the world not to come. I'm, I'm a person in one moment of being sharing with you, I see. I'm standing in one terrace of a lifetime, speaking. Once. Language. As Hafez, this other Sufi ancient Persian uh, dervish poet, he says, what does he say? He says, language, the words you speak become the house you live in. And that's so important because it means how you walk defines your next step. So be aware. Be aware of how you're being aware. And then realize freedom is you giving yourself an opportunity to take life's opportunities. It is you giving you a per giving yourself a permission for the, the behavior to snap out of its program, snap out of this loop. Logic, the issue with logic is that it can it can loop. It can it it'll, like when you, I'll tell you an example of this. Uh, for me, uh, many people because like they consider the dictionary a rational book. You know, I, I don't see many people in cultures kind of rebelling against the dictionary <laughs> of their language, you know? People just accept it as a source of kind of reality or the images or the symbols for reality. Yet, when you go look at some words, and I've kind of looked at the dictionary, I, one doesn't come to my mind specifically, but it was a word where you looked at its definition and it said it was one thing. And then when you clicked on that one thing to see its definition, it said it was this word. So it was as if two words were back to back trying to be the same thing. When you looked at each each's definition, you came to that word. It's as if two words defined by one another. It was a sort of the dictionary was an incredible development of literature. Yet it must not be forgotten. It is also just a book. So exploration becomes the focus of the educational system. The educational system will recognize the incredible ability of integration of views. So what that means is suddenly we see, imagine there was a global community. Imagine it wasn't just the internet and children no longer were denied traveling to various different countries. As if suddenly all nations were like, yo, why don't we just make this free? But of course that's impossible. Like I'm, I'm just, these are kind of parallel realities I'm seeing to the current condition of the world. And so I'm, I'm just trying to suggest that it, it's like this view where it becomes important for you to be as you are. And just through that sentence, be as you are, there's no longer the need for liberation. Something many gurus could not say, it was kind of impossible is that eventually you will reach a point where life moves your eyes, your mind and thoughts stop moving the world. It's a sort of kind of caterpillar becoming butterfly situation. It's a metamorphosis of subjective restriction over objective reality towards an objective freedom of subjective restriction.
it's weird it's strange it's like it's like we ha we acknowledge this sort of thing of like the thought being separate to the person because the thought comes and goes but if a thought remains all the time then that even by the way that's impossible but if if it did because their state your chemical like your brain chemistry is changing like every day you wake up you think you're experiencing a new day but simply it's one moment with one phenomenon occurring so cycles are are how can i tell you it's as if like the eyes of man may close, but the eyes of the universe and the eyes of existence are open. Therefore, man's eternity perhaps is not immortality where the human form survives. It is how the vision, in order to attain eternity, must, have, must realize it could never die. And eternity doesn't mean blindness of just you considering nothing. It, like... Nothing has a point. It's like, that's the thing. Some people are like, yo, man, is eternity boring? <laughs> and people would be like, Etern let me think about it. How it could, uh, could an eternal, uh, like an immortal kind of life be boring? Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I hope when you hear me speak about this content, you consider a sort of, I consider art to be the evolution of communication. I feel that the freedom of speech and mind that all these social kind of movements are fighting for, the justice of society does not is not in language prohibition. <laughs> the justice of society is in the advancement of society. And the word advancement doesn't just mean you listen to a certain instruction or a program. It's a it's an integrative thing. We gotta it's as if we before we just had to objectively live with one another, but now our minds are in some sense dancing on the same stage. And that requires a new approach. That requires a new restructuring of, the, of all systems. So it's as if Mr. Within is kind of suggesting that the civilization needs to have the rebellion of the rebellions, the greatest rebellion known to man, a rebellion against the structure of how knowledge is being, or defining, or limiting, or restricting, or whatever the unknown. <laughs> I have the sentence where I say, be free before you could not be. Or in some sense, be free before you need to be. Acknowledge that regardless of whatever personality is animated in the moment, or you in some sense project yourself as, you are this moment. And prior to any complex belief system or outline, it's just a simple moment. And there's such bliss there's such bliss in simplicity because the mind can breathe. But when the person is burdened with just objective routine, the mind cannot breathe. And this is why, again, I don't remember who the poet was, but like this certain person uh, in history, he said, um, oh my God. I'm sorry guys, the quote flew away from me. Plato has this very incredible quote where he says, time is the moving image of eternity. And we have Henry David Thoreau, this other person, saying it's not what you're looking at them at. It's not what you're looking at that matters. It's what you see. So time is the moving image of eternity. Means time, like if Henry David Thoreau was look, looking at that quote, Plato's quote, he would probably be like time, is what 
you are looking at that matters, or in some sense is the matter, and then eternity is what you see. And in ancient Vedic traditions, again, eternity was the seer of thought. The thought was, uh, was in some sense, it could not be eternal. It would come and go. The study of change is a change the serve relation. The self is no longer immobilized and its morality is no longer restricted to cultural or social or linguistic programs. It finds itself to be the liberation of a new view. That means whatever you think you are right now, I'm telling you, you're going to experience a new day tomorrow. They don't take the day so seriously or have an incredible stress and uh, depression can arise. It arises because you're, you're clinging to something. It's as if like if you were to just grip, you, like have your hand in like a tight fist and you just kept it there, your hands, believe it or not, the muscles would be paralyzed. It wouldn't be paralyzed forever. It would just be like the muscles would be so intensely kept in one way where the muscle will eventually come to its uh, uh, edge. Uh, not to its edge, to its limit. That's pretty much like why people go to the gym. They're pretty much breaking their muscle fiber and then um, recovering through protein shakes. <laughs> protein shakes those, you know, broken muscle fibers. <laughs> To be or not to be, Shakespeare said. And Mr. Within would say, the answer is not to be or not to be. It is to see or not to see because you have the choice of being accessible. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Much blessings and namaste. The journey of the 10,000 remains. Much blessings and namaste.